Chris Bukowski of Emerging Civil War for the American Battlefield Trust, and I'm standing on the Chancellorsville Battlefield at the former site of Dowdle's Tavern. The tavern itself was built in 1820 until it was purchased in 1849 by P. Bauer Dowdle, who decided he was going to operate it as a tavern for almost a decade, but in 1857, it's going to be purchased by Melcy Chancellor, a local Baptist minister. And sometime after August of 1859, Chancellor will actually move into the building itself, and the Baptist minister decides that tavern keeping is no longer appropriate. So Chancellor will live here with 11 members of his family. He'll have seven enslaved people that will work the uh, farm, which is more than 350 acres in size at the time. The Civil War will visit several times in 1862, including in the spring and in the summertime, but really it's in the spring of 1863 where it makes its mark on the property. Uh, at that time, uh, first the 12th Corps leading the federal advance from my right to my left, heading uh, eastward toward Fredericksburg with an attempt to sneak up behind Robert E. Lee's forces in the city. Uh, the 12th Corps marches past here and the soldiers and officers are not especially kind to the Chancellor's family who uh, raised quite a ruckus about their mistreatment. Uh, following them up is the 11th Corps led by Oliver Otis Howard who by all reports is much nicer to the family. Howard being a very pious man extends his kindest courtesies. Uh, but as pious as he is, he's going to be well in over his head, as events will prove just the next day. On May 2nd, Howard makes his headquarters here at the Dowdles Tavern, and reports start coming in of all sorts of movement off to now my left in that direction, to the south of the federal position. And Howard, very interested in taking a nap at this time, actually asks his second in command, Major General Carl Schertz, to open any dispatches that happen to come into headquarters so that Howard can get some shut-eye. Schertz is not a believer in the theory that that is the Confederate Army withdrawing. So he's actually going to send some scouts out to try to check things out. He's also going to have some of his men dig earthworks off in the uh, tree line off to my left in that direction there. Uh, trying to prepare for any potential Confederate movement. By the time Howard does get up and he gets more reports and he checks things out for himself, he eventually does become convinced that perhaps something's going on, but seems to do absolutely nothing to defend against it. Finally, word will come that he needs to send reinforcements down toward Catherine Furnace, which is off in that direction from where we're standing, where Third Corps Commander Dan Sickles has gotten himself into a fight. Howard is going to personally lead his reserves, the Brigade of Francis Barlow, down in that direction. Now, with all these reports coming in of something hinky going off to his south, why is Howard leaving? Well, he thinks that's where the fight is. He's not lacking in personal bravery, and so he's going to send uh, a brigade down there and lead them himself figuring that he can show example, uh, lead by example by taking them to the battlefield. But of course, Stonewall Jackson's Confederate Second Corps will disabuse Howard of any such misconceptions. They're gonna come rolling in from the west, in front of me, behind the camera, in this direction, heading toward the Chancellorsville intersection, which is a couple miles in that direction. And as a result, Jackson's movement's gonna send the 11th Corps pell-mell in retreat in this direction through the area of Dowdle's Tavern. Now Howard just returned to his headquarters as the storm was breaking off to the west. In fact, he likened it to a tornado he had seen as a kid. And he's mortified. He says, it was a terrible gale. The rush, the rattle, the quick lightning from a hundred points at once. He actually tries to rally his men and picks up a stand of abandoned colors and tucks it under the stump of his right arm and tries to lead his men back into combat. He said that he sought places to die on the field as a way to try to redeem his honor and cover his embarrassment. There will be pockets of resistance that will spring up trying to blunt Jackson's advance. Uh, one of the most famous actually takes place right in this area here known as the Bushbeck Line. Brigade Commander Adolphus Bushbeck is going to rally his men, reorienting them in their position off there, trying to put up some sort of defense. He's gonna swing them here and try to block the road. Um, retreating members of the 11th Corps are gonna fall in. He's gonna have about 4,000 men over a thousand yard front here along what becomes known as the Bushbeck Line. But unfortunately, uh, Jackson's deployment is much too powerful and it overlaps 
Bushbeck's position, particularly on the northern end where the line begins to crumble. Here on the southern end, off in that direction, of the 154th New York, guys from my area in western New York, so I got a special place in my heart. Um, they end up finding themselves driven out of their position and they also uh, all fall back as part of that pell-mell advance. Jackson himself will eventually come to this area around the tavern where he'll meet up with A.P. Hill, the commander of his uh, division that's coming in as his reserves. Uh, Hill has brought up the rear. He's gonna have to then go in and carry on this attack once it begins to bog down. But as Jackson has done some reconnaissance, he decides rather than to continue straight toward the east along what today is modern day Route 3, he tells Hill to push to the northeast. He says, press them Hill, push forward as soon as you can, make for US-4. That's gonna be a change in plan that will eventually put Jackson on a path to destiny along the mountain road that will lead to Confederate catastrophe. Meanwhile, in the wake of that forward movement, Dowdle's Tavern then falls into Confederate hands and is used as a field hospital. Several federal soldiers are actually trying to hide underneath the tavern itself, and they're dragged out by their legs, pressed into service to act as hospital orderlies. Uh, and Dowdle's Tavern, which had been the scene of rich family life just months earlier, uh, then becomes a scene of horror and carnage as casualties from this battle are tended to and the floors are stained with blood. Dowdle's Tavern will survive the war but in 1869, it will accidentally burn down by fire. There are no actual remains of the site itself, uh, of the tavern itself, because during the expansion of Route 3, the eastbound lane now covers up the site of where much of the tavern had been. And so Dowdle's Tavern is ultimately destroyed by the very road that brought the armies here in the first place. That said, this piece of property is crucial in telling the story of the Battle of Chancellorsville, and that's why the American Battlefields Trust efforts to save this property are so important. We've got wonderful stories here of the Chancellor's family, of Oliver Otis Howard, Stonewall Jackson, the 11th Corps, and Battlefield Preservation all rolled up. And we want to help be able to tell those stories for generations to come. That's why your support of this effort is so important. I'm Chris Mikowski for the American Battlefield Trust on the Chancellorsville Battlefield at Dowdle's Tavern.